So, you know, it looks like this range is so wide that it will probably not be wrong. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's not really modeling when you allow for such a huge big range, you know, because the model, if you do modeling is because you think something is going to happen in a certain way. So, right? so, so let's put it this way. Sailor went from all models are wrong to all models are correct. Yeah, this is why I, I title all the models. You know that uh, movie, you know, Dumb, Dumb and Dumber, you know, where he says, oh, you, you, you uh, so you're saying I have a chance. So, you know, so basically these models say, all of them say, you say I have a chance, you know, all of them say this. Uh, so you have all, I, I, he went from no model is correct to all model will be true, you know? So I, I don't know. It's uh, somebody says, uh, maybe somebody hacked a sailor's account, you know, and this is not really sailor posting this stuff. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of 21st Capital. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of having Giovanni Santostasi with us. He's the father of PowerLaw. He's been working on the PowerLaw model and Bitcoin modeling for many years, and he has contributed to this space uh, a significant amount. And we've been chatting offline for some time. And uh, a few days ago, uh, we are recording this on September 1st. But on August 30th, Sailor, uh, uh, Michael Saylor came out and introduced a bunch of models uh, that, uh, that uh, have, have Bitcoin price predictions. And uh, a lot of people are excited about it. So we thought maybe we will have a professional modeler who has had you know a, a long experience doing these things investigate the model analyze its merits and its disadvantages and see if sailor is onto something uh, and one reason we really wanted to do this now and actually immediately after he introduced the models is as you all know i'm also have I, i've also been interested in the power law model and i've been doing some analysis on it but whenever you you know publish uh, models like that uh, you will hear some Bitcoin personalities coming out and saying, oh, this everything, every all models are nonsense. Uh, modeling, it, modeling of Bitcoin as a financial asset, which incorporates human behavior is useless. There's nothing you can do. And hey, listen, Michael Saylor, the, the prophet of Bitcoin said, all models are destroyed. Essentially, uh, what, when Saylor was saying that, he was referring to to fiat and tradfi models. Last point is, in the near term, Keith, in the near term, these things work. But over the long term, adoption makes sense. Like all of your arguments about why you should short Facebook in 2013, they're all wrong. Facebook's trading at 280 bucks a, sh a share. They're all wrong. You should have never sold it ever, ever, ever. Now, what happens to all these wonderful models if 10 billionaires decide to buy $1 billion of Bitcoin each and announce we bought it, we're not ashamed of it, we're going to buy more? Mm -hmm. All your models are destroyed, completely devastated. Bitcoin goes to the moon because what really matters is with Facebook, does it work? Do a billion people use but it? But later, Bitcoin personalities... Uh, took this as meaning there's no uh, val no validity in any sort of modeling. And they, this has been the standard response to all of our modeling efforts that, you know, Michael Saylor said modeling is useless. Of course, uh, they all got surprised uh, two days ago when, when Saylor came, came out and uh, introduced a whole set of models. So... Uh, we were really interested in in uh, in what he has in there and uh, how uh, how else uh, people are going to attack modeling. Of course, modeling has also been extremely abused because people, you know, someone who engages in modeling a complex system should really know what they're doing. And a lot of the time, people have nice lines and nice curves on charts, which fit for a while, but they don't have strong background and over time people take them a lot more seriously than they should and actually it's also a misalignment of incentives when the when the person who introduces those models kind of is incentivized to over promise and make it look like uh you know an extremely reliable thing and not mention enough caveats 
And of course, that ends up uh, misleading a lot of people. For that reason, I understand the skepticism about, about modeling. But as you can see, like even Michael Saylor, he understands the value of models. Uh, and now he has his own. So let's hear from uh, the greats. Let's see what uh, Giovanni has for us about the, about the model. Okay. I, I would like to share my slides um, and uh, I'm going to load. Okay. All right. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Yes, very well. Okay. So um, this is how um, I entitled this uh, little presentation, this short presentation, you know, from all models will be destroyed, as you said, because believe me, if there is one person that probably heard this sentence in his life, in his life is me, <laughs> you know, more than anybody else, because they tell me this all the time, you know, in my comments, uh, there are, you know, there are positive comments, negative comments, but this is something that is repeated over and over again with all kinds of animations, you know, like of a uh, pressing machines that destroyed the Coke cans, you know, all kinds of interesting memes, you know? So, I hope I don't hear this anymore. You know, because... I was, I was like, I was sick of it. So I just can't imagine how. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you know, maybe one day we can uh, discuss about why we do models. You know, we could have maybe a meeting, another meeting between me and you, and we discuss in general. You know, how models are used in science, etc. We can have a or oh, in finance. You know, you are more of an expert than, that, than me on that, but. Uh, um, you know, we can just have a general discussion and tell people also, you know, this could be a good idea. How do you know if a model is good or not, right? How can you judge? What are the criteria? What could you use to say, okay, this is a decent model, you know, there are limitations, but, and this is not so good. You know, maybe we can have a discussion like that another, another time. Maybe we can revisit. I think it would be very useful because we want to tell people how, we, how to be more discerning you know, because there are so many of these models. So maybe we can give some hints on how to do that. A little bit of that will come out from this presentation, but maybe we can come back and revisit. Do you, you think it's a good idea to do, do that sometime? Absolutely. Okay. All right, so, uh, and you know, I made a little joke of say, we went from that to now all the models have a chance because I will explain why is the case with sailor models. Uh, so now let's uh, let's go dive in and describe them. Uh, so basically, he has three different cases. Uh, the first parameter that is uh, essential to understand these models is this annual rate of return, right? So basically, he gives us uh, uh, these three cases where, uh, uh, for the bear model, we start with this is our starting rate, right? Because you will you will see in a moment this rate change, but uh, the starting rate and I guess starting means what? Uh, now you know the day that uh, August thirty, you know when he came up with the model, uh, is it the end of the year? You know I, I, that is not clear because uh, from from what I read so far, it is not said when this applies right but uh, let's say it applies when he came out with the model so uh now more or less um and uh and so the idea is that you will start with these rates now these rates are are a little bit actually not a little bit quite a bit arbitrary but i think they are based on the, the observed current rate of return and right now uh you can do it you can use the power law because it gives you like a, a Good model for that, but you can also just measure it, right? Uh, right now, we do about 45%, something like this. So you can see how, in fact, the base model is kind of close to that rate, right? So I think this is why it's using the base model because it's based on the current rate of return. Now, you could say, well, maybe it was a good year, maybe, you know, uh, it's, an, it's an exception. So maybe we're going down from from now right so this so, so the has... starting so the starting point of the model is by a, a measure of annual rate of return for right now which can 50 percent 25 percent 75 percent for right now essentially the model starts by assuming that next year we're going to be in the base case 50 percent higher 
we are going to make 50%, but uh, minus uh, some decay because he's including also decay. So uh, next year, we are going to be two minus 2.5% less. So the, I guess, I guess this is because it, you know, there is some level of interpretation because not everything is explained. I don't know if, it, if, if a, a document will come later going in the details. Uh, there were like some video presentations where these things uh, were given, but, but I'm assuming that uh, like next year, you know, uh, we will go down by 2.5%. Yeah, yeah, I ran the numbers. Yeah, it's it's exactly that. So first year, 50% return, second year, 50% minus two and a half, right. so like a 47 and a half return. And then it goes all the way down. And several years later, it drops to 20% for the base case. Yeah, I correct. Um, and, uh, and then notice so we go 25% in both directions, right? So you say, okay, the bear case will be 25% less than that. Uh, basically, even if uh, the current one is, the current return is 46, you know, maybe says, okay, maybe it was luck, you know, this year we were up more than we should be. And so we go to 25%. It seems a big, huge change, right? Uh, just to give you a feeling, the power law says that this scenario is going to happen 20 years from now, you know, that we are going to make 25%. Because right now, the power law says, yeah, we are making 45%, but 25% is 20 years from now, you know? So it's weird that you're, is choosing that scenario as what is going on now. Um, and then there is the 75%, that maybe for some people doesn't seem a huge, big difference, but the, the compounding of it will create huge final results, different results. You know, when you compound 75%, is really different from compounding 50%. So it's a really different scenario, much more bullish. Uh, and then, you know, the second component of the model is this decay that we discuss. And again, there are different decays for different uh, scenarios. To me, this is also very arbitrary. Now it seems like, okay, we're, we're going faster up. So, you know, the change in, in the decay, you know, the decay, the change in, in the rate, is also going to be bigger, you know, if you have a, a bigger return, but okay, you know, I don't know how it came up with this number. So that is part of the problem. This, this is my first reaction to the model in general. We, we can discuss more in details, but I don't know how to interpret these numbers besides we start with a, a number for uh, the returns. So it is kind of close to what we have right now, what is observed. Um, but, but that... uh, you know, you're a physicist, so you like a formula, but here I can totally see the consulting mindset because typically in many of the consulting work, uh, they are trained to think in terms of the, you know, worst, worst case, base case, happy case or best case. Yeah, so that's exactly what they're doing. And and oh, typically, yeah, they just throw in arbitrary numbers, which seem to make sense. But uh, here, you know, doing that and then also trying to predict 20 years, 21 years into the future, that's right. like a like a huge stretch. Exactly. And then, you know, there is a, this other component that is to me also weird and uh, arbitrary, at least from a physicist's point of view, is at a certain point, you know, Bitcoin is so magical that instead of continuing this decay that has done for all this time, all of a sudden it stops. And this happens about 12 years in the future. So in 12 years in the future, we don't decay anymore. We stick with these values, you know, that is why you know i don't get it you know why, why should that should be actually right now i can tell you that's impossible because after bitcoin reaches its maximum capacity however many years um it will grow only as much as the global gdp grows which can't be 20 percent it can't be even 18 percent right it's a lot less right now it's two percent so at the end if someone even wants to cap it at some point it should be at the global gdp Go ahead. Right. So, yeah, what exactly, right? So it's a, it, it's really going to be magical Bitcoin because, you know, you invest in these things, it doesn't matter, you know, it's always going to increase that. Because again, people don't realize 18%, even 18%, it's an incredible um, compounding rate, you know, it's absurd. 
so I mean, it's great because Bitcoin is doing that, but you know, this is why we see these diminishing returns because it's going from you know uh, not mature asset to something that is more mature and something you know in twelve years from now continue to do that forever. You know, it doesn't make much sense to me, so I don't understand. Um, now, the next uh, uh, slides um, basically is a summary of these, and it says you know we start with these uh, different. Uh, fixed uh, compounding rates, um, you know, these annual returns. And that, um, because uh, uh, when you have something that has a fixed uh, um, growth rate, um, the, mod the mathematical model to explain that is an exponential, right? So this model starts like exponential, but then the growth rate, right? So usually you will see exponential times, you know, of some rate times time, right? But in this case, uh, this is the equation that describes because uh, there will be something you start with a price, you know, an arbitrary price, uh, maybe, you know, the price of when you decide to apply this model that day. Uh, let's say right now we are around 65,000. So you, you will have 65,000. So, you know, let's say around 60,000, right? Today is what? 57 actually went down, but let's say 60,000, doesn't matter, you know, uh, like a price around that. And then there is this decay, you know, these are exponential. So there is a rate, but the decay also change in time. So it looks like something like this, you know, the exponential of a rate minus of decay. And, you know, this actually could also be written as an exponential because when you have a, a, con a consistent change multiplied by time, right? Uh, then you get an exponential over a longer period of time. So it's an exponential of an exponential in a sense. Um, so this is how the equation looks like. So knowing this equation, and I think this is the right interpretation. Do you agree with this interpretation? With this yeah, type of uh, the, only difference is, the only difference is a sailor's model um, uh, is not continuous. It's discrete. So, uh, but if you use like T as number of years past, then, then we right. this is what they, this is what yeah. they use. Now, there is no reason to think that it's not continuous because it's not that there is a sudden change like that. But you know, one could make a continuous model of a sailor. But I did use years. So, you know, my my time scale here is years. Perfect. Um, yeah, and um, um, and then and and this is why you know it, it looks continuous, but it's because I use enough points. You know, where I, uh, it makes it look continuous, but these are all years. Um, I, I calculated that every single year. Um, and okay, so these are- let, Let's, yeah, let's explain the axes here. What's the y-axis, what's the x-axis? Right, so the, the x-axis is how many years are passed, simply because it's easier to plot in that way. I could have changed things around, but uh, um, basically right now, uh, we are 15 years from the Genesis block. The Genesis block is when, you know, the first block was created for Bitcoin. So basically it's the starting date for Bitcoin. That date is January 3, 2009. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, we are about 15 years, a little bit more than 15 years from that date. Um, and so I move forward in time and I add years to this 15. So when we are talking about you know, this the last date here is basically 12 years in the future. So we are projecting to the future 12 years. And they stop at 12 years mostly because at 12 years that weird uh, uh, constant compounding happens, you know, with that constant rate of returns happens. And also because in general, I, you know, I, I sometimes extend my models to 20 years. I always say it's, I would rather focus on the next 10 years and then reconsidering 10 years from now, you know, because I think that is already amazing that we have a chance with the regular Bitcoin behavior to make a prediction for the next 10 years. And going beyond that becomes even more speculative. So it's okay. And it's uh, enough to actually distinguish these three, four cases, you know, and so this is why I stop at uh, 12 years in the future. Um, and so I color coded the three cases, right? The green one is the bull one. The purple one is the base one, and then there is the bear one, that is the black one. And you can see, and then I, of course I compare with the power law, that is the red curve, uh, and you can see how they compare, right? So the 
the black curve almost looks and this is a, actually a, a log uh, you no know, this is a log log graph because you can see that the um, power law is a straight line that uh, it tell us that we're dealing with uh, a log log graph uh, and uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the uh, first model the bare one is kind of almost like a straight line right visually it looks like a straight line so it's very close to be almost a power law it's not uh, you know, in terms of a form, but it looks pretty much straight to me. Um, you know, probably because it's growing so slowly that the exponential nature of the process is not shown in uh, in these twelve years. Yeah. So uh, essentially, the decay that happens. So it grows one year for exponentially, then they drop the exponential right, exactly. growth. Exactly. Right? So it it's kind of a stepwise function that comes back to power loss uh, type growth just because they change their growth rate over time. Right. So it, it looks uh, almost like a power law, but it's not, right? Because it's really an exponential. In fact, you can see the other models, they curve up because uh, um, the fact that they are moving so fast, uh, uh, like, you know, 50% and, and then 75% makes it, and the decay, it does an effect, but it's not that big uh, in comparison with the initial rate. Um, and the, this is one of the things actually that is interesting when I discuss inflation, that when you have something that grows very, very fast, uh, if you have a little decay, it's not going to affect it much. I and mean, this is what is happening here. You see the exponential nature of the um, of this, you know, of these models. Uh, and, you know, they... Uh, and so let's uh, look at uh, the final results, uh, you know, in 12 years. So if we look at... Uh, so which year uh, is that? 2050? Uh, right. So 20, 20, uh, 40, yeah, 25, 40. uh, uh, 40, uh, 46, 36, 36, right? Because it's 12 years from now. Oh, you didn't go all the way. Okay. All right. No, 20, I, I stopped at uh, 12 years. Yeah. Uh, so 36. Um, so... Uh, and basically, the the PR model in twelve years from now. So you know, my proposal is let's let's look what happened in the next twelve years, and then in twelve years we can have another episode and and see who did it best. You know, who wear it best, who wear reality best. You know, be, between these models, <laughs> uh, because you know that is the goal of a model. You want to, uh, you know, you want to be realistic. You know, you want to uh, predict the future. It means. You want to be, you know, it's not an imaginary thing. You want so to I'll be, tell you what happens. Like a few years later, if these models don't work, um, it, they're going to change. So 12 years from now, you won't have, unfortunately, the opportunity to compare because they're going to adopt new ones and new ones and new ones. Well, people will see that and, you know, I don't know how they will react to that. We will be consistent, right? We will... Uh, the, this is the entire idea, at least my approach to the power law, that it needs to be consistent because of the, I use this uh, uh, um, principle of scaling variance. So it should be consistent. If it doesn't, uh, you know, then we will go back and not change, but actually try to understand what is happening. You know, what, what is happening to the phenomena, right? What it happens to Bitcoin. Uh, but anyway, um, so the different results are these, right? So we are talking about something like close to 15, because, uh, you know, this is how you read uh, these uh, logarithmic uh, charts, right? This, we, this is 10, and the next one will be 10, 20, so we are in between, so about 15, right? And the power law tell us instead that we are going to be uh, between 20 and 30. So let's say so this is, just let's be clear, this is oh, yeah. 20x return. Right, right. So we explain the x-axis, but we didn't explain the y-axis. The y-axis... I thought this was the easiest way to compare them, that is basically the returns, uh, the cumulative returns starting from now, wherever you apply the model. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, basically 10 will mean, you know, you, you went, we went from, let's say 60,000 Bitcoin to, uh, you know, 600,000 Bitcoin and so on. You made 10 times your money uh, and 100, uh, you know, 10 to the two, this is 100 and then, thousand right so this is how you read this chart so the final results in 12 years for the pair mark pair model it's uh, uh we say uh, something like 15 the uh, power law is more like 25 
And then see, we are already at 100 here for the uh, bullish one. I mean, sort of for the base one. And so it's a little bit above it. So let's say maybe um, because, you know, this, we are going from 100 to 200, you know, the, the next uh, peak will be 200. So maybe, you know, 120, 130, something of that order. Um, you know, nice. <laughs> I, 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 you know, listen, if Bitcoin does this and is good for Bitcoin and Bitcoin is stable and it doesn't crash, uh, because that is one of the things I try to say all the time, that uh, it's nice to be a power law because it's much more stable than exponential models. Uh, but, you know, we are going to make a lot of money if that happens, right? This scenario happens. And then we have... Is there, really even, good... is there even that much money uh, to support it? Like maybe even the most bullish scenario would hit the cases where, you know, the, all the money in the world is just not enough to reach that price. Yeah, in particular, if you go a little bit further, right? Because uh, uh, so right now we are talking about... So, you know, if, we are, if you reach uh, 100 times... We are talking about 100 trillion market cap, close, right? Uh, and that, it's close to real estate, right? To, to the real, uh, the, and maybe you know you know these numbers by heart better than me, but uh, it's not that close, like uh, what is real estate? 300, 300 trillion, so something like that, you know, all the real estate in the world, or I, I don't remember right. if it is the US. We are talking about crazy territory, right? That it's okay if you're saying maybe you know we're going to do that in 20 because the power law says eventually we go there but you know it will take more like 30 years to do to do that we are talking about the next 12 years you know imagine and you are did, you did all these studies about the inflow of etfs imagine which one could calculate which kind of inflow we need <laughs> you know it is probably something you know, many times more than what we are observing right now in the best single day that we ever had for the ETFs, you know. Uh, I did calculate on a certain point, I made a model sometime, you know, if we do, we could do this regularly. I, I can show you some of, of my models where I calculated which kind of inflow we need to stay on the power law. And right now we need about $200 million per day. And that is actually not trading days, every single day, including Saturday, Sunday, etc. And you know that ETFs only trade in the weekdays, right? So that yeah, gives that's you exactly. Actually, you know, a few months back, Fred Krueger and I did a pod and I, did, I showed an, a regression analysis of what, how e Bitcoin ETFs relate to um, Bitcoin price movements. And we had a similar number, like anytime the daily flow was below 200, uh, below 150, uh, even though it's positive flow, price tends to uh, be weak and negative. Right. So right. exactly and, like and you were saying, it's just not enough. It's, it's F, right? And in fact, uh, if you show, you know, I have this graph where I say, okay, what, how much money do we need to stay on the power law curves? And right now it's about 200 million. So it means, you know, we need ETFs and more, you know, retailers and other, um, you know, other investors. And it goes up, right? So by by the time we, I think uh, uh, in the next 10, 15 years, I usually I do my graph within 15 years. In the next 15 years, we go from 200 million to billions of dollars, you know, to continue eventually, we will need to have an inflow of billions of dollars, like 1.5 billion dollars per day or something like that. Uh, and we could do something like this too. I didn't have a chance. And so how much inflow will you need? And I'm sure, because I told you, you know, for the power law, they're talking 200 million. And then uh, by the time we go about 15 years is 1.5 billion. So we are talking about much, much more because, you know, this thing is going up, right? Very so, fast. so the most bullish scenario will capture U.S. stock market which is slightly below 100 trillion by 2036. And then right. from that point on, it's supposed to grow at a rate of 20% every year. Yeah. And yeah. this quickly captures the real estate in a few years also captures you know, all the all the money in the world. And I think if you extrapolate it to 2050, we should run out of money, right? <laughs> we should yeah, probably run exactly. out of assets. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I don't know, you know, it's a problem with this model for sure. Um, and, and uh, you know, and then, and, and we can actually discuss uh, all these um, weak points 
in a moment, but um, one by one, let's go through one by one. The first one is this, that in general, even before this one, uh, and again, I didn't, because it's, all this is new and I did certain analysis and all, others. One other thing I want to do is to go backwards with all this model and see how these models compare with the past, because I, I don't understand how any of these models will start to apply only now, it's simply because Sailor decided this is how reality should be. And so from this moment on, they do this. My assumption is if you are assuming that these models are going to do certain things, they also did something, something in the past. So because we have a decay rate, we have initial rate, we could extrapolate them in the past and then compare with how Bitcoin really did. My impression, my intuition right now, that none of this model will be able to catch what Bitcoin has done in the past. But it's important because a model needs to be consistent. It cannot change all of a sudden arbitrarily, right? You, I hope you agree with that, you know? Uh, so that is a very uh, uh, so let me let me clarify criticism. something because uh, I think I can also almost uh, uh, predict some people are gonna say what Sailor did was actually not commit to much. He's just allowing the user to change all the parameters. He has bear case, base case, bull case, but he he's also leaves it open for you to change the parameters. But the yeah. thing is. What's what you cannot change the model is the exponential nature of it, right? So you can't exactly. This is what so I'm trying it's to like say. the wrong yeah. functional form, but you can just force it using different decay levels and things like that to 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 be more and more accurate. But it, it will. But as soon as you keep stop changing it, it will continue to produce the wrong uh, result because its behavior doesn't match. It, it has the wrong functional form. Exactly. So you know, and this is what I'm trying to illustrate here because many people. I don't know if everybody knows this, but uh, the exponential form has been already excluded by the existing data because uh, everybody's familiar with this curving, right? the rainbow chart, whatever, of the price of Bitcoin. You know, it's almost like almost every Bitcoiner probably has uh, ingrained that uh, picture in their brain somewhere. Uh, you know, if you plot the log of the price, right? Uh, and then you keep the time linear because that is what most people are used to you see this curve and that curve is an artifact of this type of chart where uh, it only an exponential will look like a straight line. Anything that is not an exponential will look like it's losing ground, you know, in, because in fact, we are we are thinking that is a power law, the real behavior. So the power law is losing ground relatively to an exponential that, uh, you know, of a similar growth rate. Uh, and, and you can see that is the case, right? If, if Bitcoin was an exponential, it will look like that red line. It will not look curved. It will look straight. And in fact, it looks straight only when we take the log of time too. And that reveals that the nature of uh, the price so far, and it's not really a model, you know, this is what uh, many people confuse. It's really a visualization. You are visualizing the data in, a, in different ways. Like, uh, for example, right now, if we add a, an exponential process with Bitcoin just by just plotting it as the log of a price. So you're not doing modeling. I don't know if you call it modeling. You are just visualizing the data in a particular way. You will realize, wow, you know, it kind of approximate because there will be still variations. There will be bumps, you know, it approximates an exponential. It goes like a straight line, you, you know, yeah, just, maybe you know, if, you maybe, cut this, if you cut this chart from day 1000, Today, three thousand. Yeah. Uh, actually, the line looks like it's fitting more or less. Perhaps if you just move it a little bit downward, it's gonna look mm -hmm. like it fits. So someone can, you know, just claim that I have a great R squared, I have a great fitting line, but just because they have the wrong functional form, as they move into the future from to the four thousand, five thousand they begin to deviate from yeah, it. Yeah, this, this is actually a very good example. So, you know, imagine somebody didn't have a date, an initial data, or maybe for some reason say, you know, it's not very good data because with this and this other, you're, you're throwing it away. And then, like you say, like, let's say somebody used just 1,000 to 3,000. You can see it's still kind of curving, but maybe because we 
already know that it's curving, but you could fit a good line there and get a very good R square and say, oh God, I got uh, our Bitcoin is, is uh, working, right? I, I, dis I, I discovered how Bitcoin is working. It's this exponential model. And then you can see you will be very disappointed in the future because it doesn't follow your straight line model, right? Uh, your exponential model. Um, and so that is a problem. Now, one could say, why then is not the case with the power law? Well, first of all, we are using basically all the data. We are going all the way. We are using the Genesis block as our origin because we actually measure time uh, from that. Uh, and um, there is this other idea that power law are scale invariant that I will discuss in a moment. So the, our assumption is that Bitcoin has done the same thing for 15 years and it will do. Now, of course, as we get more data, we you know, we will we are scientists. We we will have to accept reality as it is, right? So we can continue. But the beauty of modeling, and when we do our episode about why we do modeling, etc., is that they give you a frame of reference, right? So you can say, okay, this is how the behavior has been so far does it change and you can compare it that is actually even if when you're wrong the models are useful because they give you a frame of reference you say okay this is what happened in the past this is what happened in the future there was a deviation a deviation relative to what to, to what we observe in the past so that is one very important uh consequence of doing modeling because uh they give you some kind of a framework to compare things present past and so on uh but you know i have a problem with this form of these models because they don't seem to catch what Bitcoin has done for all these 15 years. It's a sudden change where it's not motivated, it's not explained. You know, we don't see any sign right now that uh, Bitcoin, it, it went from being something else, we claim a power law, to actually an exponential. So it's, it's weird. The other thing, uh, uh, you know, this is what I'm saying. This is my first point, actually. But, uh, uh, and also this, like you say, you explain it to me. You say, you know, many times when people do this kind of consulting models, they just try to catch uh, many different scenarios that kind of seem to make sense. But to me, to my more physicist type of approach, they seem really arbitrary. They're not based, besides starting with, something that is uh, close to the current rate of return, that is uh, around 46%. So that seems to be the base model in you know, about 50%. And then you add a 25, you subtract 25. So I'm going to catch everything in between, you know, within something reasonable. And so this is my modeling. You know, that to me is not how you do modeling. Um, and then there is this additional component. I don't know. What is the motivation? You know, it would be nice if Sailor could expand on that. Why did he decide after 12 years Bitcoin is going to continue to compound at this really, really fast compounding rate, you know, interest rate or uh, return rate? I, I don't know how to explain that component. And, uh, and, like, and you know, this is more of what I already said, that they, it's such a huge range of possible scenarios that it's almost uh, impossible that besides, you know, because we start with something that is actually uh, more bearish than the power law. So this range is so huge that unless something really bad happens with Bitcoin, you're almost catching any possible scenario, right? Because it's not like, uh, oh, okay, we have only these three scenarios. Really what is meant, I think, is that anything in between is also valid, right? Because it's going to be a little bit less, um, bear, you know, a little bit less bullish than the most bullish scenario. But it's okay because it's in between, right? So also that will be okay. So basically, Sailor is, you know, trying to say I will be right anyway, no matter what, because we are going to do anything in between this huge big range, right? So that is a problem when you're modeling something like that, where uh, your uh, range is so huge that anything can really can happen, then you are not modeling at all, you know? So, the, so, so what's his worst case scenario? I think after a few years, going back to 18% growth would be the lowest 
from right. in his bear case. So bear case yeah. begins from what was it, twenty five, and goes down to eighteen percent. Correct. Eighteen percent, actually, you know, who knows? Maybe at a few years later, eighteen percent would be the rate of growth of the Nasdaq. Yeah. In uh, fact, you know, if we extend it, is uh, the black curve will catch up with the power law because you know, if you give enough time exponentials catch up with power laws. Uh, as a curiosity, by the way, NASDAQ will catch up with the power law in 40 years in the future. I did that calculation. It will take 40 years for NASDAQ to catch up with the power law. Hopefully we get hyper beaconization by then, you know, because uh, it's a really an enormous amount of time, in particular with all the technological developments like AI, etc. You know, to me, it's really like, very, very difficult to even imagine what will happen in 40 years. It'll be a very, very different world from where we live right now. Um, but, you know, it will take 40 years for NASDAQ to catch up with the power law. I think this one catches up even earlier than that, you know, because uh, that uh, even when we go to this regime of 18%, it's very fast, you know. Um, and uh, so we'll catch up with the power law. So, you know, it looks like, this range is so wide that it will probably not be wrong. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's not really modeling when you allow for such a huge big range, you know, because the model, if you do modeling, is because you think something is going to happen in a certain way. So, right? so, so let's put it this way Sailor went from all models are wrong to all models are correct. <laughs> yeah, this is why I, I titled all the models. You know that uh, movie, you know, Dumb, Dumb and Dumber, you know, where he says, oh, you, you, you uh, so you're saying I have a chance. Uh, you know, so basically these models say, all of them say, you say I have a chance. You know, all of them say this. Uh, so you have all, I, I, we went from no model is correct to all model will be true, you know. So I, I don't know. It's uh, Somebody says, uh, maybe somebody hacked uh, Sailor's account, you know, and this is not really Sailor posting this stuff, you know, because I, I, I don't understand it. You know, it's really strange. Uh, but anyway, so, um, yeah, these are my, my main criticism of these uh, uh, models. Uh, and then I want to compare with the strength of the power law. So how this compares with the power law. The power law has none of this problem because, first of all, is based on what happened to Bitcoin in the last 15 years. Some people, you know, that is another thing that maybe, you know, you are also a modeler, right? The people tell you all the time, the past doesn't predict the future. Well, it does. Many times it does, because when you cross a street, for example, <laughs> you will light the past to predict the future, because usually if you look at uh, on the left and you look on the right, that means it's safe to cross. Imagine if it was a, a Looney Tune world where you look at the left, you look at the right, and then a big train comes, right? Like it happens in uh, Willy the Coyote, you know, <laughs> other Looney Tunes type of things where, you know, yeah, something completely weird happens which it should not happen, you know? Um, we live in a world that is predictable. Uh, a lot of the things we, the things we do in life are based on making little models, right? I just gave the crossing of a street, uh, but there are many others, right? Thinking about tomorrow, there'll be another tomorrow, tomorrow, you know, and other things like that. Uh, we live in a predictable world. And it's true. I think what people, when they say this, they think how complex financial data are, uh, and it's very difficult to make predictions based on financial data. But the beauty of Bitcoin is that it's following you know, we, we can observe this, a very, very predictable path. And so, as, you know, the other day, well, I was thinking Bitcoin also takes one uh, dimension of complexity out, even though it's it's itself a very complex system, but its behavior, because uh, the supply side of it is very predictable, at least right. it takes away that part. If you look at, say, gold, you know, it's impacted by how all the miners work, what are the incentives. As the price moves, it also changes the supply rate. But at the same time, there's all these demand factors that play out. So you, exactly. have, you have two dimensional. And right now, the supply is basically constant. So you can approximate with a constant. You can say basically it's constant right now, you know. Uh, and uh, 
And also the other thing, you know, one of the reasons why we are expecting this very predictable behavior is because we have all these other components like the difficulty adjustments, for example, you know, it's not just people, it's also basically Bitcoin is a code, you know, there is the mining component, you know, uh, the cost of producing a Bitcoin can be calculated, you know, this is why we think we have a support line in, in the power law um, that is probably has to do with how it costs to produce uh, uh, a, Bitcoin, uh, a Bitcoin. It's something that it needs to be studied better, but our intuition and some preliminary data goes in that direction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right now, if you look at this chart, for example, you can see Bitcoin has been beside these oscillations, but even the oscillations are actually very regular and predictable. So you have this very, very consistent behavior and the entire understanding and hypothesis behind the power law is that this is a very special type of behavior. It's called scale invariant. So give me one second to explain what is meant with scale invariant. Basically, the idea, so imagine, look at the purple line, right? I could draw kind of a triangle beneath the, uh, the line, right? I could have, the so the purple is the hypotenuse, and then I can have a vertical side of a triangle, you know, where uh, you, you pick any time, any particular time, and that will give you a price, and then you have, uh, horizontal line, you know, the side of a triangle that is the time, right? And this, and this all in this strange way of representing the data, that is what we call scale. And scale means changes in the price and in time that are by order of magnitude. So when I go up by a factor of 10, 100, 1000, and so on. If I observe the price and, and time in this particular perspective using these changes in time, emphasizing, because this is what the log does. Once I use the log uh, in the y-axis and I use the log in the x-axis, I focus on the scale. Uh, I emphasize the scale. So I look at how things change in terms of this scale. That means order of magnitude. So I basically, Many times I use this analogy of a drone where I leave a forest. I don't look at the trees anymore. I'm looking at the forest. I'm looking how the forest is changes and growing. So if you're doing it in this way, then you can see that you can create this triangle under the, uh, under the curve. And then everybody knows when you make a triangle bigger, all the sides are proportionally scaled. They go up in a proportional fashion. That is, if you understand that concept, you understood scale invariance. It means that whenever I do some transformation, wherever I do some change in this system, if the assumption of scale invariance is true, then it will change in a proportional fashion. And so when I go in the future, I can do exactly that. I can extend this triangle and I can make prediction that are scale invariant, that are where everything is grown Proportionally, so that is what our claim is that Bitcoin somehow uh, is a process that continues to grow in this proportional fashion in terms of scale, and is a very strong scientific hypothesis because this principle of scale invariance is used everywhere in science, in engineering, in physics. We make a lot of prediction based on assuming that if I observe a system that is scale invariant. This is why we use this invariant. Variant means it doesn't change. It's a property, something that we discover in many systems. They tend to continue to be scale invariant. So, and remember, so, so the mechanism yeah. that causes this is uh, typically, uh, you know, some, some uh, behavior in the system that stays constant. For example, if you're willing to assume that a network uh, grows at a rate proportional to its age. And if that is something you, you, you assume it's, it's constant, then you can kind of simulate the growth of that system. When it's really young, it's, it's growing uh, at a certain, certain rate. Uh, you know, one year later, you know, if it's, if it's one year of age, next year it's gonna, its age is gonna double. So let's say its size doubles. Now, when you zoom out, 
uh, let's say it's now 10 years old, uh, for the same amount of growth in percentage term to happen, you're now looking at the age growing to 20 years to, to experience the same rate of growth that you were seeing at a much younger age. So, but essentially it's basically like looking at a system from a microscope, like you said, uh, like at different distances. The, the closer you go, you still see the exact same thing. The further you exactly. go, you still see this exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and this is beautiful because first of all, it gives uh, Bitcoin a lot of, uh, and you know, maybe one time we can have an interview going through the power law model in general, but it, it, you know, these uh, power laws have a special status in science. You know, this is why, for example, there is this beautiful book that I recommend everybody to read. It's called Scale by G. West. Uh, the, there is an entire book dedicated to this topic exactly because of this, because they have a very special status. They are very special. So they have a lot of uh, interesting property. And it's amazing that Bitcoin seems to be a power law and a scale invariant system. So it's a very scientific idea that we are continuing to grow in this way. And by the way, you know, uh, Sailor has these decays, but they are not explained. They are not uh, um, determined, you know, it doesn't tell us why we have decay of the growth. It doesn't tell us uh, um, why this particular value. And like you explained, I like a lot of explanation that you gave. gave. It's a uh, uh, gro this growth of this particular system that, uh, by the way, are typical of networks. And so there is also this idea that Bitcoin based in this way because it's a network. So this yeah, it all makes sense. It's like a puzzle that you are putting together and it starts to make sense mm -hmm. uh, instead of being just arbitrary. Uh, there is a decay of the returns. Like you explained, it, it goes with the age. I like that. Uh, the the system, as it ages, it kind of slows down. That is how these power laws work. It's basically, they are very similar to exponential, but exponential assume a pure exponential, not sailors exponential with decay. A pure exponential assume constant growth rate. Uh, that is the essence of an exponential. The, the power law is also growing with a certain rate, but the rate is going down with age like you that's said that's because yeah that's because you're looking at it you, i mean uh, people are looking at it on a linear scale every additional year is just going to be less and less important compared to the age as we move forward right so that becomes Correct. less and less relevant in terms of price appreciation exactly and you know people i want to remind to to go and read some of my work i did i have an entire article with uh, where i use uh, equations from these papers that discusses social networks and they have differential equations that describe exactly what you describe, how a uh, um, network changes in time. And you can see there is a, a, in the equations that they use, there is a parameter that is basically inversely, inversely proportional to time that describe how the system changes. And I use these equations, these equations are, are, are completely agnostic in terms of what kind of solution you could have. They, it's a very nice, they parameterize the equation in such a way that they can cover any possible solution. They can cover S-curves, they can cover exponential, they can cover power law. And then the goal is, okay, let's uh, do this simulation where I add the real data and see what parameters describe the real data. And it turns out you can reproduce the power law. So it's not just fitting. It, uh, I did much more sophisticated things where I, I use the equations that people use to describe networks, and it turns out they fit very well. The extraordinary thing was that you know, I could reproduce the growth of addresses, for example, uh, that is also power law. But then I say, well, the price should be proportional to the connections. And this simulation gives you immediately the number of connections. And it turns out I got the power law of price versus time. And so it's really amazing. You can you have all this additional work that we have done on the power law that supports that actually, you know, this phenomena behaves in a certain way. So the assumption is because of the scale invariant uh, property that systems that are scale invariant tend to continue to be scale invariant. It's not unreasonable. In fact, it's quite likely 
that uh, he will continue to do so for the next order of magnitude. That is the other thing that is missed by many people that don't understand this model that we are saying, listen, we are not in early stage at all because many people say we are early stage. Bitcoin went through eight orders of magnitude already. You know, this if you look at it in this particular angle of non-linearly, like you say, but from a uh, order of magnitude kind of fashion, then you see that Bitcoin went through a lot. It went through a change that involves eight order of magnitude. Uh, for eight order of magnitude, that should specify, I start with uh, the first recorded transaction between Bitcoin and USD. It was $1 for 5,000 Bitcoin. So that is, if you include that the transaction and you go to the price right now, it's about eight order of magnitude. If you include what I'm showing in the graph, it is basically data from when the first exchanges uh, were open we're talking about six order of magnitudes, but it's still incredible. We're talking about a change of a million times because it went one million times since the first exchanges were open. That is, I don't know, you are an expert. Do you know of any historical event that uh, created value that went up a million times in 15 years in all the history of mankind? Do you, you know of anything you know, that comes to your mind? Yeah, hard to think of. And also with that regularity, um, yeah. you know, when you're analyzing data, you're simply trying to find a just a general growth. Uh, but here you have a crazy curve that, you know, fits the data, however you look at it. Like you can look at half of the data, you can look at, you know, you could, you could, essentially get the same model as today if you did did this in 2016 2018 right. like yeah. very small changes in the parameters so i'm still uh you know amazed by you know why why this is happening but I know. It's also a, it, there's also a very good explanation from the network theory and metcalf law right because essentially exactly. it makes a lot of sense to assume that uh, what's happening is the power of Bitcoiners in, in making others, uh, convincing other people to join the network is a function of how many Bitcoiners there are. So, exactly. So, yeah. It's, it, an, it's an iterative process. In fact, uh, these equations that we were describing are iterations, right? It is how I did it in my modeling. If you look at the equation, it says basically the essence of the equation is the change in these parameters, it is the adoption because they did it with addresses, but they did it with price. The change in these parameters depends on where we are right now. That is actually one of, you know, that is a criticism that we give to the power law model. They say it's auto-correlative. It means basically depends on the past, but actually it's a feature, you know, it's not a bug because that means there is some kind of a deterministic process. It's a kind of iterative process where uh, the future depends on the press, you know, the, tomorrow depends on today, right? And that is because if you're thinking even logically, how many people we are going to re, uh, to Orange Peel depends on how many of us there are, right? If everybody is basically an average, we are trying to Orange Peel other people, and that is proportional to how many Bitcoiners there are already. And that continues, it's an iteration. And that type of iteration is exactly what, ta what creates power loss. So we love being simulations. actually. You can do simulations and put that mechanism into a, a simple system, and it just grows following a power law trend. Exactly. If you include uh, this decaying time, so you say, okay, because if you don't, you get an exponential. If you include the decaying time, just say, okay, it will grow with this. Like, for example, when I did it, it turns out, I can tell you the specific, it turns out that uh, we orange peel three people per day. Uh, and but that if, uh, orange peeling becomes less efficient with time. So you have to divide by the age of the system. So you're dividing that uh, uh, curbing factor, I call it a curbing factor. You divide that uh, uh, orange peeling that you do every day by how old uh, Bitcoin is in day. You can do it in days, in years, whatever. If you do it in days, because we are talking about orange peeling people every day, you divide this number by the age of Bitcoin, and then you iterate that. You can do it uh, in a computer. It's very simple, you know, it's very simple.
code with anybody. You can ask even GPT, chat GPT to do that. Uh, you produce this beautiful purple line. Exactly. So you have actually a mechanism. It exactly happens in this way where uh, uh, if we orange peel three people every day, but also there is a decrease in this efficiency of orange peeling people. And then you look at the observer relationship between price and addresses, that is about the square, you get the purple line. Yeah, exactly. So I want to say that, like, you know, it's important for people to realize this is not just, you know, one line that that fits the data. It's it's good if you, you can do that well and you can find the right exact right curves that fit the data. So that's one thing. A lot, a lot of people don't, don't even do that. Right. But it, but once you do that, you still have other questions like a proper research uh, these days, you know, is only published if you have a great data, a great analysis, but you also have a great explanation of why we are seeing what we are seeing, right? And if you don't have the explanation, you are running uh, some risks. For example, you know, when I think when Plan B ran his model, it was it, it was a good fit. I mean, and especially because he was just using all the historical data. So the model kind of optimized the fit around the data. And that's uh, that that's what uh, a regression model does. So it's it looked like it's great, but he didn't have a validated mechanism. He just assumed that it's a stock to flow, and it, he kind of combined a power law and an exponential together, which seemed to fit for some time. But the mechanism behind it was not was not the actual mechanism. And yeah. because of that, you know, you, you actually he had a very high R score and he advertised it, you know, a lot of something like 95% or something. Uh, it was fitting at the moment, but to be to be more confident that the pattern of you see today continues into the future, we always want to know the mechanism. If the mechanism makes sense, passes some tests and appears to be uh, reliable. That's the only time you have some confidence in saying, okay, it seems like, you know, I know at least one of the major forces that have has been driving behavior in the past, and I don't see any reason for that force to change or go away tomorrow. So I'm going to assume that the same forces are going to be at play tomorrow with the same pattern. And then, yes, with that, we can extrapolate the line into into the future. But if you yeah. have a line that fits the data today and you don't know the mechanism at all, uh, extrapolation might lead lead you to very, you know various places which may not be correct. Uh, have you ever done that analysis where you took half of the data with uh, uh, S2F? Uh, uh, because you did it with the power law, but uh, did you ever done it with S2F? Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, what was the result? So, yeah, I mean, if you if you go with the very first version that Plan B uh, presented, uh, well, of course, uh, it keeps deviating over the years, like uh, from the actual price. But what I'm seeing is it's really hard to find the actual parameters because they are changing. Like every time yeah. he's he's adding more and more data and changing the parameters. Well, if you yeah. update the model every day. Right. It, well, it but that, that is also the, the other problem because if you do it in a consistent way, where you say, okay, there is a, a power law, because by the way, you know, he actually starts with a power law. It starts with a power law between price and S to F. If you say there is a power law between S to F uh, and uh, um, and the price, then there are not really free parameters because you will get uh, by fitting, you will get both the slope and the y-intercept. And then if you are consistent, you should use only these parameters and nothing else. There is no room for interpretation there. But we, you know, we can discuss that maybe another time, maybe we can have an episode on S2F. Um, and, so you know, maybe uh, yeah, can... let me just finish this by saying this. Like yeah. even, even right the, the day Plan B introduced the model, uh, if uh, you did some tests that I later did with power law, for example, at cross validation test, you would be able to see that this, the, the specific functional form that he assumes is not a great fit. It seems to work well in the historical data, but even back in 2019, you would be able to test the model and see that it, it fails to predict accurately in the future. Yeah. Uh, I did the same thing with the power law model it works into the future as well. So 
I did all of these tests actually before, you know, before <laughs> before uh, getting interested in the model at all and uh, and uh, you know working on it. So, uh, and, and by the way, you know about uh, this is why we need an episode uh, about modeling in general and show all the things that can go wrong with when you modeling, so people can learn from that. I think people will like that. Um, I did a model. I don't know if you know, but uh, I took soccer prices. Uh, you know, World Cup soccer prices. And why did they do that? Because they happen every four years, right? Um, and so, and they go up, they actually go up because, uh, you know, inflation or whatever. So I took these uh, values and then I fitted them uh, with a power law and, you know, price and these uh, prices, basically doing what has to have those. And I get a wonderful fit. <laughs> With an incredible R square, like 0 0.96 or something like that. Okay. You know, one of the best ways to get super high R squared is to have a junk model. So right. a lot of people exactly. don't know this, you know. It's not easy to increase your R square if you drop the quality and increase complexity. If you add more parameters, R square will just go yeah. up. So it's not enough on its own. But what is difficult is something with like uh, um, the power law where you have one, first of all, it's a continuous model. It does with another way of getting big R square is to have clustering. That is the other thing, the other problem with S2F, right? Imagine I have a big uh, blob that is completely uncorrelated. And then I add one more data point or maybe even a cluster over there, the R square will be fantastic. You know, uh, it gives like kind of a leverage having clusters like that. Uh, and you can correct me if I am wrong, because you know, you know, you, you know this stuff better than me uh, technically um but you know exactly i agree with that it's not i never been impressed i was never impressed about the power law high r square per se it's one component is when you put everything together that is impressive and you're right but you know so then basically the power law has all these good things as all you know the advantage of explaining the past and being consistent with the past and having this special status of being a power law that is a very different functions for many other functions as this very good property of scaling variance that means usually like you explained there is a process behind the creation of a power law power laws don't come out out of nothing there are these iterative processes and the idea is that they will continue because that is the other thing that people don't rely. Bitcoin has went through many equivalent of ETFs. It's not that ETFs, for example, because sometimes people use ETF to say, you see, this is what is going to change the behavior of a power law. It's a, such a dramatic event that is going to change everything. No, because uh, Bitcoin had a similar event happening in the past. It's just that we were smaller and proportional to where Bitcoin was at the time in terms of price, market cap, and everything, adoption, etc. We had institution coming before. We had, you know, there was this guy called Drapers, you know, in old time. He was one of the big first institution investors. It was Draper, people maybe forgot because, you know, uh, news uh, of a certain cycle times. He was like Celo. He was like Celo. He was this large... Uh, fund that uh, was very public about investing in Bitcoin and everybody was talking. You remember about him, right? Uh, what was his, uh, the name of the fund? I, I forget. Uh, um, Panther, Panther Capital, something like that. Pantera, yeah. yeah, Pantera, Pantera, I think. Um, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, but he was very famous. I, I have been in this uh, field for 12 years and I have a long memory about all these events. I can close my eyes and go and see all the news that we're making a big deal about this guy investing in Bitcoin. We, at a certain point, we had uh, um, Houtstock. Do you remember that company, Houtstock? The, the CEO of that company was making a big deal about making possible to buy things online using Bitcoin. Uh, you know, so there were many different events, both good and bad, that were proportional to everything happening in Bitcoin. So when we talk about these iterative processes and these events, they have been consistent and growing proportionally in all the life of Bitcoin. So all the things that people think that are going to happen in the future, in my opinion, 
are going to happen to Bitcoin because you know it's a kind of a feedback loop where Bitcoin grows, it calls the attention, it calls the resources, it calls uh, all these investors. They don't happen by chance. They happen at certain points because people see the value of Bitcoin and that is attracting the investor. This is why you get this feedback loop, right? And it happens in a very precise manner because it's proportional, whatever happened to Bitcoin is proportional to where Bitcoin is. It's a best, it's an assumption that we are making, but it seems a very sound and very reasonable assumption. And this is what creates power loss, exactly. You know, so it's not crazy to say this baby will continue in the future. Uh, I mean, just to uh, uh, just to add um, another example to what you said, if you look at the growth of a city, and if you look at the, the sizes of cities over time, you know, the, it follows a power law typically. Or, or the GDP, and uh, even the GDP. Yeah, yeah. Well. But, but, but you can say like in a city, like how many things change in a city, right? Different people, different uh, projects, different events. But it's like there is some sort of a, a natural limit to how fast we can grow that kind of pushes cities to grow following that pattern. And that doesn't mean it's got, every city is going to follow the exact same pattern. It just gives us a kind of an average expected behavior. Right. I love it because, you know, they could be even um, bigger disruptive as, uh, example, you know, events in, in the life of a city. It could be good events like, you know, maybe a big corporations moves in and there are more jobs, etc. But usually these events, even when they are, first of all, they are always proportional or most of the time to where the city is. There is a reason why, even if sometimes there are these situations where a company goes in a small town, usually it doesn't happen because it's very disruptive for the city. You know, they don't have the infrastructure, you know, it can cause more problem than actually uh, being a good thing. And so big companies usually tend to go to cities that are of a certain size. And so that is the entire thing that uh, all these events happen because they are proportional to where the system is. It's an iterative process. If a city reaches a certain, it's like leveling up. Think about leveling up, right? You don't all of a sudden go to a level that is not proportional, or you don't, when you play a video game, you don't fight against enemies that are very different from you. You know, everything is done in a proportional fashion. And that is what is happening with Bitcoin. It's both what we, can see from the existing data, but also logically, it kind of makes sense, right? It, uh, it's like solving a puzzle and the, uh, even this piece fit, you know, that uh, yes, it should be like that, right? the resources that Bitcoin attracts at, a, at any particular time are proportional to where Bitcoin is at that particular time. And that type of process is exactly the type of mechanism that gives rise to power laws. And this is why we observe the power law, and this is why we think the power law will continue in the future. Great, great, awesome, awesome explanation. And so I uh, do I you want to wrap it? Yep. Yeah. So that, this is my wrapping slide. That is, <laughs> you know, for sure, uh, his sailor is right, and he continues to be right about there are no second best. Bitcoin is this, for sure the best in terms of uh, assets, and in my opinion, he's wrong in his models where his models are not the best while the power law is the best and there is no second best. It's not even a comparison. So uh, this is my concluding slide. And you know, this is what uh, I think right now about this. But there is not really a contender. I, did, I don't know of any contender for the power law. Uh, yeah, so for sure, sellers he, model are not. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, he I, I can tell he hasn't, really you know done a deep dive into this but he has the right intuition so he begins with an exponential and then he realizes okay we're never gonna you know, keep growing at uh, a 25 percent uh fix from now so he kind of has that intuition to okay we have to reduce the rate uh, a little bit because it doesn't make sense but then it has all kinds of other things it it has just a fundamental uh uh, use of an exponential, which kind of makes creates the problem, but then he tries to fix it through those decays. So um, I think if he spends more time on it, he will just figure figure out what to do because the data is very clear. 
but right. uh, but at at the same time, I'm very happy. I mean, he's been a he's been a massive contributor to the space. He's very well spoken. He convinces people like very easily. He is a great champion. Um, and and I'm glad he came up came up with models because now people can't say all models are wrong. At least absolutely. At least uh, if you believe in Sailor, you you he has one model. So <laughs> yeah, well, may, infinite ones, but uh, yeah, I mean, a range of them. But great, yeah. I, I was actually pretty happy because now we can leave at all models are uh, destroyed behind us. You know, awfully. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for your time and your work. It was a pleasure. I look forward to chatting more. Thank you so much. Bye.